Today we're back in New York for another episode of Talking Watches. We'll be speaking with a man whose collection is one of the most interesting and unusual in the world. His name is Roni Madvani, and today we're Talking Watches. So Roni, I want to thank you first and foremost for joining us on Talking Watches. It's a pleasure to come and meet you. This is a different kind of take on, on watch collecting than, than we've seen before on this series. You know, this is not about complication, this is about design, and in this case, case design. So if you look at your collection, we see that, that most of these watches are shaped. You know, they're, they're not just a traditional round watch. What is it that attracts you to, to these special watches? I've always been a lover of the arts, and I think to have something on your wrist, which you have and you're able to feel and see and stuff, and it's something wonderful to appreciate. And you've been collecting watches for, for how long? Probably about 30 years or so. Like most collectors, you sort of get into everything, and over a period of time, your tastes get refined, and you specialize, and, and I sort of leant towards Patek Philippe in terms of just the offering, in terms of vintage and design, and, and that was the brand yeah. I and, focused on. And what was the first Patek Philippe that, that you purchased? It was the Gilbert Aubert 3424. I'd seen it in a catalog for Antiquorum, well, what was the precursor to Antiquorum, Film and Habsburg, I think right. they were called. And I'd seen that, and I think it was quite, I searched for it for a long, long time, and came across it through a, who's become a friend, Alex Ciani, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the first one. Yeah, and then we see more of these similarly styled watches. Absolutely, within the series, there were four made. I've got three of them. This is another one which is quite rare out of the four. To wear it is quite something. It's just so insanely different, I think. And what is this? This is a Vacheron I bought recently. It's the first of, I mean, I've struggled with Vacherons primarily because of the lack of information available for a collector historically and stuff. But this was just a one-off that I took a fancy to. Kind of snuck into your collection. Absolutely. And then this Audemars Piguet dates to the 19th. That one's, well, it's got an inscription on the back from 1964, but I think it was about 1963 when it was actually made. And what is it about this, this AP that you love? The shape, the dial, and it's so different to what APs are now. This is so, in my mind, so elegant and refined, and it's so beautiful. It is. The two-tone dial on this is really remarkable. Absolutely. And so the collection moves from GA paddocks to this, and this one has a very specific story behind it. That's right. So this is a reference 2549. I was looking for it for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, and I could never find one. Those were the days before Instagram, and one was posting on the internet always, and I think every collector of vintage watches knew I was looking for this wretched watch. <laughs> and finally came up for auction at Antiquorum, and Charles, who used to be there, put me in touch and said, well, look, it's there, you must bid for it. And where I live, in the middle of Africa, the internet's very unreliable, and to bid live, it's not something you want to do. Something will go wrong and your connection's gone. So I put in a fixed bid onto it, and I lost. I got an email from Charles, I think about three, four weeks later, saying that the gentleman who'd bought it, and he didn't mention who it was, having sort of found on the internet that I was looking for it for so long, wanted to offer it to me at the same price that he paid for it. And I thought that was quite cool and amazing and stuff. And I subsequently found out it was uh, Jason Singer. Um, <laughs> and I've met him a couple of times now. Once was at JFK in transit. But I thought that was just, he's just an amazing guy. I mean, to do that, it, it just shows you that there's some amazing people out there. Absolutely. And so something that you mentioned briefly, so you live in, in Uganda. What is the watch collecting community like? Uh, there isn't one. At all? No. Doesn't exist? No. So the internet is, is really your vehicle to... No, to it's opened up. And one talks of the internet sort of changing the third world, and, and it, it definitely has. And, and in terms of watch collecting, it, you know, it's, it, you, I wouldn't have been able to put together a collection like this without the internet. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. And so this is kind of the, the sister to... to uh, the yeah, I mean, this is a two, reference 2550. It's also sort of mid-50s. Um, the dial is beautiful, and the case absolutely stunning. And this winged kind of Patek here? Okay, this one, again, is one of the ones I was looking for and looking and looking, and it's hardly ever come up for auction. It's carved out of a solid case of gold, and I think the case maker was Markovsky, who I think made some of the best cases for Patek in the 50s and 60s. I came across it, and it was in with a dealer in Hong Kong, and who'd bought it from the original owner in Indonesia, and it came with all the papers from Bear and stuff. One of the, my favorites in my collection. And then we go into a steel Patek. I've got a few steel ones. There's the 2508, which I think is lovely. This is probably the classic in my mind, the 565. And in many ways, this sort of has everything one would probably want in a 565 in terms of sweep seconds, the Breguet numbers, the luminous hour markers. So it's a lovely piece. And we see this A-magnetic 
on your Instagram feed all the time. It's, uh, it's my favorite one. It's on my wrist. I've got a couple. This has got the retailer's name on it, but mm -hmm. this is the one I travel with all the time. I, I don't know what it is. It sits on my wrist for most of the time. It's just easy to wear. Yeah, absolutely. And then this paddock here? Again, it's a rare one. The reference is 2471. I owned a Rolex Prince jumper and stainless steel. And unfortunately, that was one of my mistakes, that I saw this and I was kind of looking for it. And I gave up my jumper, which is actually featured on the cover of a coffee table book. And I gave that up and traded it in for this, and that was one of my regrets. But <laughs> <laughs> you still like so this one? I like it, but when I see it, it kind of annoys me that I, I actually gave up something good. And then one of the, the few non-paddock Vacheron APs that we see on the table here is this Sintre. I've liked the Cartiers from the sort of 30s and stuff, and to find them in good condition. And the sizes also, I wear all my watches, so anything less than 32 is difficult for me to wear, and if it's more than 37, it's also a problem. This particular watch, this was before Richemont took over Cartier, and I was friendly with the team at Bond Street in London. And I said, well, could I you know, design the dial? And I did some homework and stuff, and took a design, which I think is very Art Deco, another passion of mine and it was translated into this after two or three years of back and forth. And so we see the, this amazing collection of, of all-time only, very simple watches, and then we have a big, bad Platinum 5004 from Paddock. How did that come to be? I'm not really a buyer of modern watches, but that was the beginning of the modern pieces, and I'm in the process of putting together a collection of rare configured dials of modern Paddocks. And where do you see your, your collecting going in the future? Is it more of this? Is it more complicated? I think that there's still miss missing pieces in the jigs one. One obviously comes across something. You may say, well, I only want these ones. But right. you'll find something that you know, someone will offer you and say, well, well, I've got to have that. And I think it's endless as well. So after a while, you realize you can't be the paddock museum, and you've got to get rid of some stuff. There's been occasions where I've seen something, and I've had to trade three or four watches, and it burns my heart to do that, because I'm always getting a rotten deal. <laughs> um, when it's at that moment in time where you don't have the time to get what it's worth. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, when, when you look for something like this, some of these obscure shaped paddock references, it's not like sending out a ping saying, I want a 2499 or a Paul Newman. These are things that are really very limited in terms of, of scale and scope for, for people to understand. Them. Sure. So how do you do it? I, and I think with the internet, sort of once people sort of find out the genre that you collect, people do tend to sort of offer you and say, well, I have this and I have that. Each watch has a, in the hunt for that watch means something in terms of the process involved to get to acquiring that watch. And I think the journey also entails meeting lots of different people from all over the world. My family think I'm crazy. You know, I go to countries and randomly meet people and uh, they laugh at me and stuff. But it's funny that some of them have turned out to be close and dear friends of mine.